Welcome everyone to Nanoscope's clinical perspective discussion, which features presentation and discussion of Nanoscope's lead clinical candidate MCO10, an ambient light activable multi-character X-ray, opsin MCO, optogenetic monotherapy and its potential role in treating retinal degenerative diseases, including retinitis pigmentosa, which will refer to to as RP and Stargardt disease, to inherited retinal diseases, which together represent the leading cause of blindness in working age population. MCO10 has been granted orphan drug designation by the FDA for both diseases. On a personal note, I'm deeply honored to be part of this team that is working together to develop an effective treatment for RP and Stargardt disease. As someone who has relative who have been affected by RP, I have personally seen the devastating impact this causes to patients and families. Any product that restores vision would therefore reverse the course of natural history and make a huge difference to patients' lives. RP is a rare genetic disease and unfortunately, most patients eventually lose most of their eyesight. There are approximately 90,000 patients in the U.S. that are blind due to RP. Stargardt disease is the most common inherited single gene retinal disease characterized by macular degeneration that begins in childhood, adolescence, or adulthood, resulting in progressive loss of vision. Roughly 15,000 patients in the U.S. are blind due to Stargardt disease. Currently, there are no cure for either disease. However, we believe that Nanoscope's MCO is the only therapeutic platform that provides broadband light sensitivity with fast kinetics and ambient light activation for vision restoration. Let me show how this technology works in this video presentation. In the case of RP and Stargard, the photoreceptor cells Responsible for normal light perception degrade nanoscope, MCO therapy imparts light sensitivity to bipolar cells, which are abundant and retained after disease-related photoreceptor loss. In this way, MCO therapy makes bipolar cells act as new photoreceptor, taking the place of those lost to disease. Nanoscope's MCO10 gene therapy utilizes intravitreal injection of convenient and well-established office procedure to deliver an AV package transgene encoding the ambient light-sensitive MCO protein into retinal bipolar cell. This leads to robust and long-lasting expression in bipolar cells, which persist after photoreceptor loss. A large in number also uniformly organized, providing the potential for high-quality vision restoration. Because the bipolar cell layer is naturally integrated with the existing visual processing circuitry of retina, light-sensitive bipolar cells are able to efficiently pass visually evoked signal to the brain through the optic nerve and thus restore vision. The MCO molecule is sensitive to broadband light, meaning these visually evoked signals are generated in MCO-treated patient in ambient light environment. Nanoscope's MCO optogenetic gene platform has potential to address all form of retinal degeneration and is applicable for patients suffering from complete or partial damage to retina. We are developing MCO10 with the goal of changing the treatment paradigm and providing vision restoration to hundreds of thousands of patients. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we anticipate several potential value creating milestones. In the first quarter of 2023, we expect phase two B3 top line data for MCO10 in RP and phase two six month data for MCO10 in Starga. In the first half of 2023, we plan to conduct an end of phase meeting with FDA for MCO10 in RP to align on requirement for the BLS submission. In the early 2024, we anticipate that we'll submit a BLA for MCO10 in RP and expect an approval and commercial launch around the end of 2024. Now let me turn our agenda for today's event. We are very fortunate to have two distinguished guests with us today, Dr. Stephen Sang and Dr. Victor Gonzalez. Dr. Sang is an acclaimed geneticist in patient with retinal degenerations and a practicing ophthalmologist at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center Edward Harkness Eye Institute in New York City and specializes in medical retina. 
Dr. Gonzalez is a practicing ophthalmologist and is the founder and CEO of Valley Retina Institute, McAllen, Texas. Dr. Gonzalez is also affiliated with Valley Baptist Medical Center, Harlingen, South Texas Health System, Harlingen Medical Center, Mission Regional Medical Center, Rio Grande Regional Hospital, NAP Medical Center, and Doctors Hospital at Renaissance. Dr. Gonzalez is also co-investigator in one of our clinical sites for Stargard and RP studies. From the Nanoscope team, Dr. Samar Mohanty, our co-founder and president, will detail the molecule and design of MCO10 and review preclinical data amazed today. Dr. Aaron Osborne, our CMO and CDO, will review the clinical trial design for our fully enrolled phase 2B program for MCO10 in RP and our phase two fully enrolled multicenter trial for Stargard disease. Aaron will also moderate an interactive panel discussion and will address your questions. Before we get started, I want to state that neither Dr. Sang or Dr. Gonzalez are employees of Nanoscope, but they have been compensated for the time in relation to this event. And all opinion expressed during this discussion belong to them and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of their affiliated institution. Now, let me turn the call over to Dr. Stephen Sang. Dr. Sang. Thank you, Sawatna, for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, the status of my field and also some of the uh, work done in my laboratory. So we'll focus on retinitis pigmentosa today, retinal degenerations, uh, affects about 10 million uh, people and retinitis pigmentosa is the most common form of inherited form of retinal degeneration. Patient uh, initially lose the uh, rod, the night seeing cells, and then eventually lose the cone cells leading to this uh, eventual central vision loss. To talk about the impact of retinitis pigmentosa, I'd like to bring you the attention of how CMS uh, looked at uh, payment. How do you compare cataract surgery from uh, gallbladder surgery? The quality of life one means perfect health, quality of life zero means that when a patient cannot see 2020, which is the perfect vision, they will have a quality of life similar to someone with an amputation or uh, chest pain. You need 2040 to pass the driving test in most states. When patients get down to about 2060, the quality of life units that patient will fill out will be the same as someone that is on dialysis or hip fracture. When patient cannot see the big E on the eye chart, the big E means about 2400, so it's pretty close to 2250. Uh, the cost uh, taking care of a, a blind person would take at least $47,000 uh, in uh, 2006 in value. In terms of thinking about uh, treatment for retinitis pigmentosa, there's a staging system uh, uh, done by Jose Sahel, uh, Bolton Raska, and uh, Jean Bennett. A uh, stage one, when the cells are still there, so patients need to be fairly young, that you can see both the rods and cone cells are present. And then uh, gene therapy, uh, giving the gene uh, using genome surgery will be highly effective. And this is uh, how uh, the strategy used in the first uh, gene therapy approval in medicine by Medicare and Medicaid. When then the, uh, the, the, the rods are gone, then the cones are left. There's a lot of uh, uh, trial that's been used using neurotrophic factor or antioxidants because uh, uh, the current phase three trial. Eventually the cones become sick and die, which is at the later stage, stage three. And then many uh, pharmaceuticals is using optogenetics to kind of make these remaining cones more robust by introducing uh, channel rhodopsin uh, in, uh, in, uh, for the cones. And at a later stage, uh, then when eventually all the cones are gone, 
you still have some bipolar cells left and the ganglion cells. So electronic retina that can stimulate the ganglion cell or stem cell replacement to replace the dyed uh, photoreceptors has been used. The challenge for gene specific treatment, precision medicine, there are about 80 different genes can cause retinitis pigmentosa. May not be so practical to treat all uh, 80 different genes by going to FDA 80 different times. And also the conventional uh, uh, treatment is uh, uh, using subretinal injection. Patient needs to go to the operating room to inject underneath the retina. As uh, you hear, some of the optogenetics is doing intravitreal injection, which can be done in the office. It's uh, less tra traumatic to the patient. This is an example in my laboratory of a uh, subretinal uh, injection in, in a retinitis pigmentosa mouse model. After a single treatment, you can see that all these uh, modeling salt and pepper retinopathy uh, are gone one single treatment for the lifetime. This is uh, one of my patients now getting the uh, FDA approval luxterna therapy before uh, treatment. The patient uh, doesn't do vitamin A metabolism and that's why it's black. And after treatment, it restores vitamin A uh, metabolism. Then you can see that the autoporosant uh, return and patient improved by three lines of vision. Although this uh, precision medicine treatment has been highly successful, uh, the, uh, the cost maybe uh, make it less uh, practical. There's already reviews written that maybe you should think about in precision medicine treatment. Uh, for example, uh, cystic fibrosis has a highly uh, effective treatment for one mutation. This drug only works for one mutation in the gene cystic fibrosis. And it costs uh, three hundred thousand dollars per year. It's interesting how they price a drug for three hundred thousand dollars per year, because uh, before treat before the FDA approval, uh, the treatment for a cystic fibrosis patient is about three hundred thousand uh, dollars lifetime. Patient for cystic fibrosis before this new drug, uh, unfortunately would, uh, would would die from bronchiectasis. Uh, of pancreatitis uh, in the 40s. But if precision medicine become available, uh, uh, say for Stargard, uh, you will cost about $30 billion. And Medicare has only about 700 uh, billion. So this, uh, there's lots of editorial written about uh, the cost of precision medicine that maybe need to consider in precision medicine. And now I show you that uh, uh, optogenetics is one of the tools to uh, this uh, uh, imprecision medicine to treat all these different 80 uh, genes uh, in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. They, they, uh, stage one needs to be gene specific and cells need to be uh, present. And stage two, they, they, there's some tropic factors or including antioxidants. And, and I'll show you some examples of that in the next few slides. And when all the cells are gone, the cell, cell replacement stem cell is the, a prosthesis electronic retina, stage four. So early stages, when the rods are gone, you can still protect the clones from dying. And there are many trials now, phase, uh, phase three, uh, using N-acetylcysteine. There are some other upcoming trials using serine and serine trophic factor has been uh, used. And, the only randomized uh, clinical trial is uh, on vitamin A. Uh, they got to phase three. When all the cells are gone, the electronic retina, Medicare uh, cover the cost of electronic uh, retina. And then at the uh, advanced stage, uh, the, the many uh, stem cell replacement trials ongoing. And at this advanced stage, of course, is uh, optogenetics also will play a big role. Is one of my patients with electronic retina, the, the first generation with about six, eight, uh, 16 dial on stimulating the ganglion cells on top of the retina. Later, later uh, CMS Medicare uh, approved a 64 dial with a higher resolution. 
and then many uh, embryonic stem cells on the induced propotent stem cell trial ongoing for retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration. The challenge for cell, cell, cell replacement is that first of all, you can see the surgery is kind of challenging. You can see the bubble when, say, when the cells are injected underneath the retina. When the cells are placed initially, the white dots is when the patient can fixate, so cell replacement can work. But eventually, you can see the dots have to scatter. The patient are not able to fixate on the, on the graph. The graph yeah, is a dark, uh, darker uh, uh, cellular structure underneath the retina because of rejection. Optogenetics would not have this problem of uh, rejection. And the conventional layer optogenetics you use to say to uh, make the uh, remaining cone cells more robust. But then the, the uh, MCO010 have the capability not only work on stage three when there's still remaining cone cells, as long as the bipolar cells still uh, well connected. And also stage four, when the cone cells are gone, but the bipolar cells uh, here later are still present. And that's uh, is, uh, where the expression of the MCO010 uh, uh, goes. So really has, uh, uh, can uh, overcome some of the barriers to, for retinitis pigmentosa to uh, uh, improve the quality of life because they work at, uh, pretty advanced stages and, in that, and it does not need to be so mutation specific and can cover all these uh, 80 different genes causing retinitis pigmentosa. If you're interested uh, to read more about precision medicine, gene specific treatment, CRISPR genome engineering, or stem cells, feel free to read uh, more of these books. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sang, for sharing the epidemiology of IRDs, the lack of approved and effective treatments, and the various approaches seeking to bring treatments to patients. I'm going to present our solution to this problem, first starting with mechanism of action of gene agnostic MCO optogenetic vision restoration with bipolar cell-specific targeting. Next, I will talk about unique structure and functional characteristic of MCO platform, and proprietary AV-based targeting of bipolar cell leading to vision restoration at ambient light level. I will conclude highlighting the differential product profile that our approach presents for real-world vision restoration. The challenge of restoring vision in these patients is grand because there are hundreds of IRD causing mutations and each patient's mutation would have to be known prior to photoreceptor loss for classical gene therapy to be effective. And even if confirmatory genetic testing could be completed for each patient prior to significant vision loss, a toolbox of hundreds of gene replacing and editing therapies would be needed to address majority of these patients. Such a toolbox would take decades to develop uh, while optogenetic has the potential to address these patients even after the photoreceptors or RP cells are lost. Intravitreal injection that we in our program allows pan-retinal MCO expression needed to re-photosensitizing the retina to have peripheral visual field needed in the severe patient population. Further, the intravitreal injection can be performed in office setting and is scalable to address the widespread need uh, for treatment of these patients. MCO sensitization of bipolar cells, which are proximal to otherwise present rods and cones, creates the potential not just for vision restoration, but also restoration of high quality functional vision as bipolar cells uh, preserve a lot of visual processing circuitry. MCO10 comprises of an engineered AV2 capsid, which has been well studied in preclinical and clinical trials to allow expression in bipolar cells. Uh, the multi-characteristic of MCO is the transgene, which is driven by a MGLU-R6 promoter enhancer for on bipolar cell specific expression. MCO is a fusion protein that is highly light sensitive across the entire color bandwidth of visual light with fast kinetics to minimize blur. 
the unique MCO construct maximizes conversion of light to electrical signal, potentially enabling detailed and high quality vision without the need of any external device such as goggles. Our design of optogenetic program combined the important properties required to restore return to life vision in desired the patients. That is fast and sensitivity across the entire color bandwidth of visible light with fast kinetics. Here you can see the data from our MCO research illustrating the performance of MCO in these key categories. As you can see, the on and off response of MCO is in millisecond range, which is activable by broadband ambient light and sensitive to low light intensity without requiring an external device. So this has the potential to restore high quality vision across severe IRD patients. Intravitreal injection of MCO10 has shown dose-dependent MCO expression in bipolar cells in multiple species. Robust and long-lasting expression of MCO has been observed. Here you can see co-localization of the red fluorescence of MCO reporter m cherry with green fluorescence of bipolar cell marker in both blind mice and blind dogs. MCO expression could be achieved in 80% of the targeted cell upon intravitreal injection of MCO10. Functionally, MCO10 has shown to restore ambient light perception that was longitudinally measured by visual water image performance. In severe retinal degeneration mouse model, RD10, this example is shown here, where the mice have relatively normal vision in the first few weeks of life when they can be trained to find a platform located under a beam of light. As the degeneration progresses, the mice makes errors and time to reach the platform increases, as you see in the bar graph. Following intravitreal injection of MCO10, the vision-guided performance improved substantially, indicating vision restoration at ambient light level. Notably, this effect was not only significant in mice model of RP, as you are seeing in the middle panel, but also uh, for mice model of Stargard, where the photoreceptors have mutation, ABCA4 mutation. So both the time to reach platform and number of errors is significantly reduced in multiple animal model, showing the potential of this technology in across different IRDs. Next. Uh, in addition to ambient light perception, the MCO10 treatment of retinal degenerated mice led to increased visual performance as measured by optomotor response. So when black and white stripes of different width are moved, the mice move their head and the improved response of this mice movement was observed longitudinally at multiple level uh, of light intensity, demonstrating the potential of MCO10 in restoring high quality vision. Now I would like to discuss the key differentiation of our MCO10 program. There have been several attempts to leverage the gene agnostic nature of optogenetics to develop treatment for IRD patient population. A few of these approaches have been able to impart some light sensitivity in preclinical and early clinical studies. However, most if not all of these approaches have struggled to achieve the necessity sensitivity with the required spectral bandwidth and response time to produce the level of vision necessary to patients to return to life. This slide shows our assessment of MCO10 compared to other optogenetic approaches that we are aware of. Since our approach allows expression of MCO in post-mitotic cells, a single intravitreal injection is deemed adequate for long-lasting effect. MCO10 targets retinal bipolar cells that are abundant and close to otherwise present rods and cones Thus, MCO sensitization of bipolar cells preserve most of the visual processing. MCO has high light sensitivity and no goggles or external device for amplifying the light are required. Uniquely, due to multiple light sensing components in the fused MCO protein, it is sensitive across entire spectrum of visible light. Also, due to fast response speed of MCO, it has potential for high-quality vision without blur. 
MCO10 has completed phase one, two study with positive proof of concept data now available and in two late stage fully enrolled clinical trial with top line data expected in Q1 of 2023. The rapid enrollment of all three clinical studies demonstrate the unmet need, the innovative MCO platform and the excitement of the clinicians as well as our passionate and experienced clinical team to rapidly translate this technology to patients. Now, let me turn over to Dr. Aaron Osborne, CMO of Nanoscope, to take us through MCO10 clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you, Samar. My name is Aaron Osborne. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Nanoscope Therapeutics. Today, I'm going to present the MCO10 clinical program, which consists of a completed phase one, two study in retinitis pigmentosa and the ongoing phase 2b and phase 2 studies in retinitis pigmentosa and in Stargardt disease. I'm first going to talk about the phase 1 2 clinical trial. Um, this was a first in human study that was in patients with advanced vision loss due to a clinical diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. Participants could have any genotype. Indeed, genotyping was not performed uh, for eligibility criteria. Uh, initially, three patients received the lower dose of 0.6 times 10 to the 11. Uh, once initial safety was observed, three patients received the higher dose, and then the study was expanded with a further five patients receiving the higher dose. The core study was 52 weeks, with the primary endpoint being safety, and secondary endpoints being long-term outcomes, including vision-guided mobility, visual acuity, and patient-reported outcomes. The safety profile was favorable with no serious adverse events or systemic adverse events related to MCO10 observed. There was no endophthalmitis, retinitis, choroiditis, or any severe ocular adverse event. There was some mild to moderate inflammation in some subjects, which was typically self-resolving, although steroid eye drops were given to two of the 11 subjects. Intraocular pressure increase was retreated and resolved with IOP lowering agents, and no increase in neutralizing antibodies against AAV2 was observed in the serum, suggesting no systemic immune response. By week 52, there were no signs of active inflammation in any patients, and no patients were taking uh, any concomitant medications. So a favorable safety profile was observed, warranting further study. Two vision-guided mobility tests uh, were performed in this study. This video of the Y test shows the patient unable to see and move towards the lighted panel. Here, the patient moves to the right and apparently does not see the panel. However, 16 weeks after MCO10 treatment, uh, the same patient appears to be able to observe the lighted panel and moves towards that panel and touches that panel. This is an example of, a, of an improvement in this Y test score from baseline following administration of MCO10. Overall, we saw improvements in multiple aspects of vision-guided mobility following MCO10. Importantly, MCO10 patients were often able to see and to navigate in dimmer light conditions than they could prior to treatment. Overall, Y mobility test improved over time. Additionally, the A mobility test, which, which was a similar test but simulated a doorway, showed that the time to find the lighted panel and the overall A mobility test score improving over 52 weeks. The improvements were typically seen uh, around the week six to, uh, six to 24 period, and they were fully maintained through to week 52. Uh, the, the diagram on the right shows that all patients that were able to improve their A-test score by two light levels did so in this study. So five of 11 patients had a potentially clinically significant two light level improvement in their ability to, for, to perform these vision-guided mobility tasks. 
Following MCO10 treatment, there were also substantial improvements in visual acuity. Here we see that seven of the 11 patients improved by at least 15 letters in terms of their visual acuity. 15 letters corresponds to three lines on a site chart and is well known to represent a significant improvement, a clinically significant improvement. The natural history for these patients is not one of improvement, it's one of gradual decline. Besides seven patients improving by a clinically relevant amount, three of those patients actually experienced at least double that improvement. And these gains correlated with improvements in terms of the Y and the A mobility test, as well as patient reported outcomes. To summarize, there were substantial improvements in visual acuity and in vision guided mobility after MCO10 treatment that were fully maintained through 52 weeks. Patient satisfaction was high with reports of improvements in ability to perform uh, activities of daily living and improvements in quality of life. These were reflected by the substantial improvements in the NEI VFQ25 score uh, that were observed. The overall average composite score improved by over 30 points and the vision specific dependency score improved by over 40 points. Clearly the data from this first clinical study of MCO10 are exciting and support conducting further clinical trials. We've prepared and submitted a manuscript for peer review. The phase 2B restore randomized control trial is a robustly designed, sham controlled, multi-dose, multi-center trial in patients with severe sight impairment due to retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, these patients have visual acuity similar, although some slightly better than the patients in the phase 1-2 trial, which were counting fingers or light perception vision. Uh, these patients in this trial have a similar level of vision impairment of, of 1.9 logmar or worse. The key eligibility criterion is the presence of inner retinal cells on OCT, uh, which can be assessed by a simple eye scan. Uh, the key outcomes in this trial are the multiluminance Y mobility test, which is a development of the Y test and the A test that were used in the phase 1-2 trial. Uh, that was developed after discussion with regulators and other experts and uh, uh, led to the adding in of obstacles and additional luminance levels um, to increase the reliability and sensitivity of the test. Additional endpoints are the safety profile, visual acuity, another proprietary test, the low vision multi-parameter test, which now incorporates a three-dimensional component uh, to simulate activities of, of near daily living. Uh, we also have pupillometry and patient reported outcomes. The primary endpoint is at one year. Starlight is an ongoing open label uh, phase two study uh, in patients who have a clinical or genetic diagnosis of Stargardt disease. This study utilizes a single higher dose of MCO10 and also allows patients with somewhat better visual acuity, although still in the range of severe sight impairment of 1.3 to 1.9 logmar in the study eye. This enables the use of a conventional sight chart, uh, and that is really the key difference in the assessments, which are otherwise all the same as the ongoing uh, RESTORE study. Both the RESTORE Phase 2b and the Starlight Phase 2 are fully enrolled. These studies enrolled uh, very rapidly, uh, which we believe is due to the fact that MCO10 is genotype agnostic, so no specific gene mutations are required, simply a diagnosis of severe uh, vision impairment due to one of the diseases under study. Uh, there's a lack of alternative treatment options for these patients with severe vision loss that has the potential to restore vision. Um, and, you know, I think we found that our investigators had a positive first experience with both the trials uh, and the investigational medical product, which led to rapid enrollment timelines. Overall, these trials remain fully enrolled and in the follow-up period. 
There have been no ocular SAEs reported to date, and we have top line data from each of these studies that is expected uh, towards the end of Q1 2023. I'm now going to hand over to Victor Gonzalez, who is a retina specialist um, and an investigator in both the Restore and the Starlight study. He's going to share more information on the generation and design of the endpoints that are used in these studies, as well as share his perspectives on MCO10 treatment. Victor? Thank you, Aaron. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to provide you with some real world uh, clinical experience with the MCO10. Uh, as you know, these, these patients have severe vision loss and, uh, and we've designed two different protocols to evaluate these patients. The RESTORED trial uh, randomizes patients with severe vision loss as a result of retinitis pigmentosa into one of three arms, a, a control, a low dose, and a high dose. And these patients are then followed for a, their primary outcome at 52 weeks. The inclusion, uh, requirements are that they have severe vision loss and anatomically they need to have uh, retinal tissue that uh, is our target, which is the bipolar cells. Um, they are then uh, play, evaluated both at baseline using a, the Y mobility test, which is a very important test that puts them in real life situations to evaluate these patients' ability to pass these tests at the beginning of the trial, and then they're evaluated uh, through the 52 weeks to see if there's any improvement there. They're also required to, to pass a uh, 3D dimensional test. It's called the multi-parameter test, and I'll describe it a little later. And then we will evaluate visual acuity for those patients as well. The second phase to trial is the starlight. And here we have uh, a, a first in, in uh, in human study looking at uh, patients with severe vision loss as a result of star guards. Now these patients have a little better visual acuity than the RP patients. Uh, and they are, uh, uh, they are given the high dose, it's an open label study given the high dose of the drug and evaluated through uh, the 48 weeks to see what improvements we have on, on their patient's ability to, to, to function. Um, the recruitment for this, these trials has been uh, very smooth. Uh, and I believe this is a reflection of the fact that there is a large population out there with uh, severe vision loss as a result of these two conditions that uh, satisfy the entry requirements for this uh, study. Uh, the fact that for retinitis pigmentosa, this is a, gen a genetic uh, or genome uh, agnostic uh, requirement is very important. Previous studies uh, and previous treatments required very specific genetic defects, and that's very difficult because very few of those patients would, would uh, uh, satisfy those requirements. With this uh, new approach, we can... Uh, provide treatment for the majority of the patients that present with the severe vision loss as a result of these two conditions. Um, they also receive a very convenient and well-known treatment, an, a single intravitreal injection. And in order to activate the, the system, uh, one does not require uh, goggles like in many of the other studies, just simple ambient light is enough to activate the, the, the system. Uh, the only requirement, as I mentioned, is the presence of the inner retinal layer. And as I pointed out, a large percentage of the patients that we screen in our trials, you know, satisfy the, this requirement. For that reason, we had a very low screen failure rate. And, uh, and I believe this is one of the important reasons why there was rapid enrollment in both the RESTORE and the STARLIGHT clinical trials. The benefit uh, identified by the patients is also the reason why we've had a very high retention rate in all these patients on follow-up. Now, the benefit of having the, a well-established uh, delivery system is going to be very beneficial, not only for the patients, because a lot of the patients have heard of intravitreal injections, 
but the benefit also will be that the majority of the retinal specialists worldwide are already experts at intravitreal injections. And this is a very well established uh, uh, method to, to treat and deliver drugs. And um, it's highly accepted by the retina community. And it's been a very safe uh, treatment approach for many retinal diseases. The multiluminescence is why mobility test is very important in, in that it's a situation that provides us with real life activities that the patients need to be able to uh, do successfully in order to have a meaningful and productive life. Uh, what happens in this is that we test these patients at different uh, intensity of light. They are required to find not only find the illuminated panel, as you can see in this example, but they are required to, not, to avoid the obstacles on either side and a central obstacle. So if you see all the red lines here are failures, the patient has to have a very specific uh, approach, avoiding the side obstacles, avoiding the central obstacle, and also being able to identify on which side of the room the 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 lit, lit panel is in so uh, it's very challenging and and to see the patients uh, in these trials go from a situation where they can't pass this to you know at the end of the trial be able to navigate this has been very exciting um, the patients pass if they can uh, have an accuracy of greater than 50 percent uh, the patients fail uh, if they touch the LED in a period longer than 60 seconds. Uh, and the subjects will pass a light illumination level only if they pass uh, three out of the three trials. So it's a very rigid, a, a very difficult test that if the patients are successful, you know, clearly demonstrates an, a significant improvement in their ability to, to uh, be mobile and independent. Now, why is this test so important? Well, a change in vision guided mobility by at least two illuminations compared to baseline may be considered clinically meaningful. Uh, the scoring system enables simple comparison to baseline and or placebo and is performed by a central mass grader. So it's not us that are doing this. That someone who's completely uh, blind to the treatment is able to evaluate the patients at these different light settings and will grade the, the improvement that they see over time in these patients. And why are these different illuminations is important? Again, as I pointed out earlier, these are situations where the patients will need to, to uh, face and, and successfully in real life uh, daily activities, including, as I as pointed out here, different uh, moonlight nights uh, to uh, being in a train station and, uh, and, and navigating from one uh, part of the station to another. We also will test them using a 3D discrimination uh, uh, system. As you can see here, the patients are, are asked to uh, identify different shapes. Um, they uh, are tested at five different uh, illumination levels. And the patients pass each illumination level only if they get three of the, uh, out of the three uh, trials. So again, very rigid, uh, very uh, specific change in identification that the patients need to do in order for them to successfully move to the next level. Again, demonstrating the ability of this treatment to improve uh, the function of these patients in real life settings. So in summary, the benefit of the MC10 is that it is a gene agnostic approach to treat a large population of patients with severe vision loss to, to retinitis pigmentosa and star guards. The multi-luminensis Y mobility test and the 3D shape discrimination test can serve as reliable and relevant methods for assessing functional vision and low vision subjects, reflecting the real life patient activities of daily living. The high acceptance of the delivered procedure and the high patient satisfaction have resulted in 100% patient retention in both RESTORE and the STARLIGHT studies. The top line data from the double mass sham controlled randomized 
multi-center phase two B trial for retinitis pigmentosa or the RESTORE trial will be expected in the first quarter of 2023. And we're very excited because the impact that this will have on patients with this severe vision loss worldwide is going to be very meaningful. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, so could you describe a little bit about the level of vision impairment that patients entering these MCO clinical studies have got? Uh, how does it affect their, their activities of daily living and their lives in general? Well, you know, retinitis pigmentosa and Stargardt's are both inherited retinal diseases. And uh, the we believe there's a pre-programmed uh, death of cells. And, uh, and these cells are very important because they're the cells that capture the, the light. Uh, we need these cells in order to activate the neural network from the retina to the brain in order to process images. So it's a progressive chronic loss of vision to the point where, for example, retinitis pigmentosa patients begin to have severe constriction of their visual field. And in a sense to simulate that, if you wanted to do it, you know, you can just you know, put your your hands in front of you and, and have these two little straws looking out and trying to maneuver. So as they progress, they begin to become uh, disabled with daily activities. And what's so, what's their prognosis? Does it continue to get to get worse through their lives? Yes, you know, for both it gets worse. For uh, star guards, they get, they tend to they tend to start losing their central vision. So. Uh, Stargardt's patients will lose their ability to, to read and have acuity. Um, our retinitis pigmentosa may have that also, but the most common thing to happen is for them to begin to lose their sight vision. So eventually they can meet what is called uh, visually uh, impaired or, or uh, permanently disabled. And that's defined by the best corrective visual acuity being in the best eye 2200 or worse and a visual field constriction of less than 10 degrees. And a large percentage of these patients eventually become disabled. And what's their experience with receiving uh, MCO therapy in the clinic? How do, how do they receive it and what's it like for them? And what uh, what's their experience after receiving the therapy as well? Well, you know, this is exciting for not only the patients, of course, but also the us as physicians, because the natural and normal thing for us to do for these patients is to keep telling them everything stable as their visual acuity and their function continues to worsen. Uh, given the ability now to provide them a treatment has been exciting. Uh, the excitement here is that there is now the ability for us to begin to treat patients agnostic to what the genetic defect is. We've had one treatment before, but it has to be very specific. Now we have an opportunity to treat all comers. And do you get a sense then of how meaningful a treatment might be that can restore, you know, some vision, any vision to these patients? You know, uh, these are patients who many of them are still young and they're still very active. So they've lost their ability to work and be productive. Many of them become depressed because of this. But now, you know, giving them that glimmer of hope, it's been very exciting for them. You know, one intravitreal injection has resulted in many of these patients in these trials to, to begin to improve. Their outlook is fantastic. Their ability to be independent has come back. And, you know, that makes us and them feel very happy. Wonderful. I'm going to bring Dr. Sang in here. And, and, and Dr. Sang, I'd love to get your thoughts a little bit on the current treatment landscape for these patients. And also, you know, previous optogenetic approaches, optogenetics has been around for a little while and several approaches have not shown, uh, you know, clear evidence of efficacy in the clinic. What, what, what do you think makes the nanoscope approach uh, different and what excites you about that? So the current uh, Medicare, Medicaid approved treatments is uh... Precision medicine based, it would be specific to, to uh, the gene defect. Uh, Nanoscope can uh, overcome that this uh, precision medicine uh, that they can treat all the different AT mutations and cause uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And previous optogenetics require the delivery to 
to uh, uh, the ganglion cells quite similar to the electronic retina. Uh, there's some uh, limitations of the electronic retina, uh, epiretinal prosthesis stimulating the ganglion cell. And, uh, and the, the narrow scope view works on the, the, uh, the bipolar. Bipolar has a, a, a closer and still would utilize the, uh, the remaining retina for the integration of the information. So bipolar is a, a lot cl closer to the uh, photoreceptor uh, is in, in terms of the wiring. In addition that the, the uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the advantage of the uh, narrow scope is that in most of the, when most of the uh, star guard patients and retinitis pigmentosa patients, when they come to see me, already not, not so eligible for, for mm -hmm. gene therapy, uh, conventional gene supplementation therapy because the cells are not there. So in order for gene therapy to work, the cells need to be there. And, uh, and there's an ongoing trial with, uh, with uh, antioxidants, it also require the cells to be uh, the uh, to protect the the remaining cells. So you need the cells to be there for for this kind of uh, uh, neural protection type of um, antioxidants therapy or uh, from uh, from gene therapy. And in the narrow scope uh, technology, that um, that even though the light sensing neuron photoreceptors are absent in in the uh, retinitis pigmentosa or star guard, the ganglion cells, and also the, the, uh, the in particular for narrow scope, the bipolar are still uh, working pretty well. So the narrow scope has the ability to reprogram the, the bipolar cells to function them, uh, to let them function like uh, light sensing neuron. So what stage of disease, both in star guard and retinitis pigmentosa, do you think a therapy such as the nanoscope MCO10 approach is likely to give the most benefit to patients. So pretty advanced stages, right? So so previous uh, optogenetics technology, uh, uh, I tried to uh, give uh, 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 restore some light sensing activity of the the cones that have not completely died away. Uh, at least uh, to give them light sensing ability to the uh, disease cone cell. That's one of the uh, com common optogenetics platform. And I'll, I'll do I'll do in the ganglion cell as a as similar to the epiretinal prosthesis. But so I think there's a special niche to to utilize the uh, the bipolar that narrow scope is uh, using. So patients don't need to have photoreceptors in principle. And uh, most of the star guard patient when they uh, come to presentation and also the retinitis pigmentosa patient they don't they don't have photoreceptors. So 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 that the the, uh, the, uh, the reprogramming of narrow scope technology on gang on the bipolar has this particular niche to cover, uh, in principle, all all different forms of retinal degeneration. Wonderful. So, I'd love to bring in um, Samar Mahanti, um, the uh, co-founder and president of Nanoscope. Here, you know, there's a couple of key design features I think of MCO10 that that that, that are contributing to its potential here. You know, it's an intravitreal treatment, but it also has a a broad spectrum. Uh, opsin that can operate across all of visible light. It's also highly sensitive and has very fast kinetics. And we're just wondering, you know, what do you think were the key design considerations when you came up with MCO10 that have led to this success, both in animals and now we're seeing in humans in being able to restore uh, navigational vision? Samar. Yeah, so definitely first, uh, we these patients that uh, we are targeting, target patient population having pan retinal dystrophy across uh, uh, the whole retina. So with an intravitreal injection, our target is how to make sure that this protein expressed in the inner retina uh, with an intravitreal one-time injection. So we uh, have a rep cap modified vector where the opsin is packaged and it allowed in multiple species more than 80% of the bipolar target bipolar cell expression. So that was the important factor. And we have a promoter, mglu R6 promoter enhancer, which targets specifically on bipolar cells. 
Uh, then coming to the MCO Opsin, it's a platform technology. It has three different components derived from three different microorganisms. And they basically cover uh, the whole sensitivity towards the whole visible spectrum. So one of them is a transmembrane ion channel and uh, and then there is a ligand which is sensitive to complementary color and an enhancer protein which actually re-emits absorbed light to enhance the overall effectiveness of the protein so all these features about the opsin uh, does not compromise the kinetics has a broadband sensitivity and sensitive to ambient light uh, makes it very unique and uh, and the intravitreal injection with the proprietary av vector my understanding is that no other approach has been able to use an opsin that's sensitive across the whole the whole uh, spectrum of visible light. Um, is that yours as well? There's no other approach that has done this, and how is it possible? Yeah, that's that's correct because uh, this uh, this uh, optogenetics is based on my opsin derived from microorganism, and even our cones are specific to a narrow band of wavelength. So as I mentioned, so what we did is the transmembrane protein, which is sensitive to certain color spectrum narrowband, but the ligand is sensitive to other colors and it acts as a lever to actually pull uh, the transmembrane and allows ions to flow. So we can use all these different components of this MCO opsin to be sensitive across the visible spectrum. Got it. And so bipolar cells obviously connect to both rods and to cones, and they could give both peripheral and sharp central vision potentially. We've seen improvements in both aspects in the clinic. Preclinically, we certainly saw improvements in ability to navigate. Um, what's your sense as to what is most likely to be improved? Is it likely to be you know, sort of central vision, sharp vision, or is it more likely to be the navigational vision that patients lose, you know, early on in retinitis pigmentosa? I think definitely navigational vision will improve, but our preclinical study also have shown there is an improvement in visual acuity uh, significantly uh, improved even at 0.25 cycles per degree for a mouse, which will translate to... Uh, almost 20 by 60 like vision if we target the bipolar cells efficiently. Of course, it will depend on how many bipolar cells are transduced in, uh, in the patient and also the distribution of the virus uh, uh, or the transduction pattern in the retina. Now, we heard a lot, I think, about the, um, the multiluminance Y mobility test in the presentations. Um, and clearly, this has been developed based on the phase one, two trial, and then adding in a diff, uh, additional luminance levels after discussions with FDA and other stakeholders, as well as additional obstacles. I wanted to bring back in uh, Dr. Gonzalez here because you've got experience with this test. And one key thing about a primary endpoint um, is that it should be something that is clinically meaningful and relevant to patients. I wanted to kind of ask what your experience of that endpoint is, and do you think it's kind of reflecting what patients need to do in the real world and is a robust endpoint? You know, I think the endpoint is very important, I, and that, you know, when you think about what you need to do to be able to function uh, during the day and different uh, you know, different lighting situations, right? And early in the morning, you need to be able to drive and be able to see as the sun rises. That can be challenging even for some of us. And a patient that has, uh, you know, inherited retinal disease can, can do that. The lighting in the room at work, the lighting at home. So, you know, in obstacles in front of you, uh, all of these are addressed with the current test. So, and that's reflected on what I've seen of these patients. You know, it's it's really exciting for me to see a patient who gets guided in, who at the beginning can't do the obstacle, uh, it, you know, by the end of the study, be able to walk himself into the clinic, go room to room, and be able to navigate that uh, particular, uh, you know, obstacle course. It's, it's very meaningful for these patients because they will tell you that they're independent and they become much more functional. Wow. So is, is that what excites you the most about this approach, that it can, can bring back that degree of functionality and independence to patients potentially? 
you know these patients you know their their uh their mood uh, you know they're depressed at the beginning at the end of the study they're completely different people who have become very productive uh, some of them have kept logs you know and one of them that was really uh, you know tear jerking in a sense was a woman who basically said look i hadn't seen my child's face in over six years and Yesterday, I saw him for the first time, and I can tell you that that was a tearjerker for my staff. We we're all very emotional, very excited to be able to provide that type of recovery for our patients. That is that is fantastic to hear. So, you know, if MCO10 were to be commercially available, um, how many of your advanced uh, retinitis pigmentosa and Stargardt patients do you think it would be a, a good therapy for? I'll tell you, right, you know, in our study, you know, right now we, we've screened and uh, of all the patients that we've screened, uh, almost, I'd say, 80 plus percent of the ones that we screened have have uh, uh, been eligible for the for the trial. So it, I can tell you that because it's gene agnostic, um, all we need to make sure of, as Dr. Zhang pointed out, is that the structures that we're targeting are intact and we've been able to have a high incidence of of uh patients being a, eligible for the study and and the benefit of the study is obviously seen and and appreciated by the patients because once they're in the trial our retention rate has been 100 percent and one more question now we enrolled those studies quickly and i think i you know i shared a few of my own thoughts as to why that was um what, what are your thoughts about the speed of the enrollment in these trials and what that suggests um, with regards to the applicability of MCO10? Well, it, it, it's, there are a couple of things. Some are not great, some are good. You know, the not great one is that there are so many patients out there that need this treatment. That's why there's so many out there that are potential candidates. The good part is that it's gene agnostic so that we can provide this treatment regardless of the genetic defect. So it's very promising, and I think we will have a very significant impact on these conditions worldwide. Wonderful. Well, we are approaching the top of the hour. I'm sorry that we will not get to all of your questions. If any of the call participants have any additional questions, please email them to nanoscope at argopartners.com, and we'll respond individually. I do want to thank Samar, Stephen and Victor for a robust discussion and for providing your valuable insights today. It was extremely helpful to hear your perspectives on how the current therapies are limited and how MCO10 can alter the treatment paradigm for both of these diseases and provide a meaningful difference to patients. So thank you again for your participation. You may now disconnect.